On today's episode of the Talking TV podcast, we discuss the newest HBO addition to the superhero genre, executive producing created by the ever controversial Joss Whedon. We are here to talk about the new period piece superhero uh, edition, The Nevers. I am Dom the Movie Nerd. I am Chris, the TV nerd. I uh, I hope you guys never have to watch a series debut this messy again for the rest of your lives, but we're here to break it down for you today anyways. So, we took the hit. It's going to be a wild ride indeed, and we hope you guys enjoy this episode of the Talking TV show as much as we do giving it to you guys. What's up, buddy? Not much, man. It's a little earlier than usual, dude. Good morning. It is. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's funny because, it, well, it's not not really because we kind of did this last week. But again, just like I feel like, I don't know. It feels like it's been both super long since we last got together. But also it feels like it's been there's been like no time at all just because of like how busy I've been this past week. I agree with that. Yeah, man. Life's funny like that, you know. It's uh, you, you, yeah, you, you it miss really one is. day because you throw up a few clips and the whole world feels different when really it's uh, we're back it doing really the show does. again. It really does, which is great, man. We yes, have- actually, we are. Yeah, we had the uh, we had the giant monkey fighting the giant lizard. Uh, what's called? We took a little bit of a break for Easter and we covered like the saddest and, and most depressing animated movie ever made. Yeah. And now we're back. I, I feel like we're back to like a little bit of our usual fare as far as that goes. You know, we've got a new superhero show to talk about. And I love that you brought up the idea of a messy debut because when I read you off some of the names that are involved in this show, you're, you're going to laugh as far as their involvement because it quite literally, I feel like this show that we're about to talk about is the definition of all the guys from the Marvel Netflix show that got fired from Netflix the minute that like Marvel took back all the rights to the shows that basically started putting them on Disney Plus and Warner's literally just stepped in and was like, okay, we'll take you guys. We'll partner you guys with the guys who they, is no longer associated with Marvel in order to basically create like our version of a superhero show and this is the result in a weird way. Like, <laughs> I'll say this. I didn't hate this show, this show at all. I actually kind of dug the pilot, but again, it is simply a pilot overall. So people... Without further ado, we're going to start breaking down the debut episode of The Nevers, which aired officially for the first time last night, April 11th, on HBO Max overall. It's a new show. It's a period piece slash superhero story, which is something that we really haven't gotten before. But before we actually jump into it, Chris, I wanted to know, like, kind of what your thoughts were, like, kind of going into the show. Yeah, going into the show, I was excited for it. I I do enjoy this uh, period. I enjoy the steampunk aesthetic. Um, I, I, I've sort of gravitated towards that in my own personal creativity in regards to like artworks for past musical projects, sort of echoing some of that steampunk feel and, and that like sort of Victorian, but technology that's ahead of the time sort of vibe. I've always been influenced by that, I guess, like, or, or sorry, gravitating towards that as a consumer of media and the video games I've played. Like there's a great series called Dishonored and it's just a steampunk sort of like murder mystery story and it's very popular game and a lot of people like the setting so I was intrigued you know I'm of this generation I think steampunk's pretty interesting and so I was kind of looking forward to a refreshing take on something that we are all but inundated with th- this day and age and so yeah my, my spirits were high going into this one what about you yeah yeah, the interesting thing is that steampunk has never necessarily been something that I've gravitated towards, per se. It's kind of always been that thing where I'm like, why why, why do we feel the need to do this? You know, like, I'm like, I'm all about period pieces. I love period pieces when they're done right because it always just gives the costume and production design department a chance to go absolutely apeshit with the visuals. And when they're done right, they're done really, really right. But the steampunk thing, I don't know. I've never really kind of gravitated towards it, mostly because I've never really seen anything where it works per se, but I thought this kind of looked cool, you know, again, Joss Whedon, pre-controversy and everything, you know, I I still like his work overall, I thought it was cool that he was returning to TV overall, and the show definitely looked poppy and flashy enough to really catch my attention, so I'm like, okay, cool, I'm definitely, I'm definitely going to want to check this out overall, and now after we watched the pilot, I can definitely say that I wasn't disappointed, but at the same time, I also wasn't, like, elated per se, but the question is, 
Is that necessarily Whedon's fault, or is that more so the fault of the overall kind of let's say gluttony and inundation of content that we have? Because I before we get actually into the stuff that we're going to talk about, I did want to bring up that I truly believe that not just with superhero content, but with content in general, we're really, really getting to the point where just to be able to watch anything is just starting to feel like a chore, just because of how much overall content there is. But without further ado, let's get into the spoiler-free review section of it. So this is the part where we'll just give our basic overall breakdown of the show. So the show starts off with, you know, kind of this interesting thing where it shows all of these different people in Victorian-era England you, you know, they, they look up and they see something in the sky that we're not entirely sure of. And next thing you know, it cuts to a couple of years later and it shows that there is this orphanage, again, let me know if this sounds familiar, that basically runs this kind of super, this haven for all of a sudden these super powered individuals. And they basically do this thing where it's like, oh, you've got, the, they do that X-Men thing where it's like, oh, the few of them that can like blend in with the rest of human beings because their powers are more psychologically based. And then you have the one where they have the physical abnormalities, you know? And of course, you've got the basic brain breakdown of, oh, there's the people who think that they're a danger to society, and there's the people who want to experiment on, you know, it's hitting all the beats as far as kind of this type of superhero affair goes, you know, and it's interesting because I've kind of been in this weird spot with kind of some of the alternative superhero content that we've seen where we're kind of past I feel like the super deconstructive stuff like The Boys and Watchmen. And now we're kind of just getting into the, okay, what are the different types of superhero stories that we can tell while still kind of maintaining the superhero fun stuff that people love, you know, as far as the action and the punching and the rebelling against society and all that. And it's weird because this came out remark very, very close to another show that I'm watching, which is Amazon's animated show Invincible. And I think that that show is handling it right as far as being this cool, interesting balance between, like, kind of, you know, the classical superhero struggle that we're kind of used to, that we enjoy, versus incorporating some of, like, the new modern storytelling sensibilities in there, you know, as far as that being, you know, an adult animated cartoon. But this show kind of does a little bit of the opposite of that, where it's much more so of a genre piece than a superhero piece, I would say. It leans into that definitely, and I actually think that's one of the show's strengths overall, but at the same time, it does also fall into a little bit of that cliche territory, if that makes any sense. You know, like, 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 like let me know. Am I making any sense here as far as this goes? Yeah, you are, except there's one major thing that I disagree with uh, the community who I've seen covering and writing articles about this. this. This isn't a superhero story. Just because there are people with abilities does not make it a superhero story. Look at Sci-Fi's The Magicians. Same exact setup. True. They're all these kids who live in the underbelly of New York City, and there's this sort of deeper layer with magic, and they all find each other because that's just how these stories have to happen get them all in the same place they meet the big bad and then they go off on their adventure and then they end with the cliffhanger we get season two right but that's not a superhero story that's just three seasons into the magicians and that's how they've done it every time i think there's a sickness honestly i think people are superhero sick i was thinking about this this morning as i was gathering my thoughts on this and you know we just want so much of superheroes that i think marketing had no choice to sort of with what's happened to Joss and with the fact that, hey, this show was in production before what came to light. And so we've already sunk a boatload of money into this. There's a lot of CG. There's a lot of elegant uh, outfits and set designs and sort of like set dressings that old Victorian furniture, which is very expensive. And, and they have so much of it in this show. They had to recreate. First of all, recreating period pieces alone is a very expensive endeavor. So I just think to best salvage this project, because a lot of people obviously are turned off to it just by the big name attached to it. Um, I think they had to throw superhero on it because what, what else are people watching these days as, as a majority whole? I mean, it's it's superhero this, superhero that. And I think that's really the only reason. Super, yeah. They're gifted, sure. They're they're touched, yes. sure. But, I mean, the magicians were touched in the sci-fi show The Magicians. They're not calling them superheroes. You know, look look True. at yeah. look at look at the Witcher, right? Uh, those those right. witches, right? They're not superheroes in the Witcher land. They're touched. They have some similar abilities to some of the people we've seen here. I don't know. What, what's your take on that, though? No, no, you're right. Honestly, the problem with that is again, it's the fact of I literally just watched this for the first time last night, and I literally just woke up. I wasn't saying and got you. So, yeah. I'm, no, 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 no. I'm saying I'm blaming that as far as the marketing playing its tricks on my brain. As far as I see something like this, which again, I automatically assume okay, period piece X Men, and then I see Joss Whedon's name on it, and that's just my fault your X-Men for com- kind of falling in for the marketing. Your X Men comparison right, I, I is very pretty- on point. 
I mean, let's be honest. I think so, yeah. And that's always been the interest, but that's always been the interesting thing is that we kind of have this, you know, disposition in our head that the X-Men are superheroes, when in reality, the X-Men really aren't superheroes in the same way that the Avengers are. So I guess that's kind of just where my brain went as far as that goes, because you're right. It's very much not a superhero show as far as that goes. It's much more so a kind of like, um, a, a, it's like it's like a piece on like kind of like, so, you know, um, like societal perception and like different so levels of social class and different perception as far as based on external abnor abnormalities. It's a racism allegory is what it is um, overall. And I think that, how do I put this? I, I think that definitely the show has a lot of promise as far as where it could go still with the storytelling. But I don't necessarily, again, I don't want to make this statement yet. Because it is still just the first episode. But I, already off the bat, I can see that we're already in for some very familiar storytelling for storytelling techniques going forward. So, with that being said, unless you kind of had anything else that you wanted to add to it, I feel like we we definitely should start to get into the points of yeah. the show overall. But people, The only thing I wanted to say was, uh, first of all, to Mithrin Deer in the chat, thanks for hanging out, man. Appreciate that, as always. Uh, that's a great name, by the way. <laughs> right? And uh, That's a great name. And, uh, yeah, he, he knows his stuff for sure. And uh, so, guys, do you agree with us? Are people superhero sick? Is this just an allegory, you know? Let us know in the comments. Subscribe. Check this video out. Hit, hit, the, hit the subscribe button and, and the like button, the, the notification button. We have a bunch of other Nevers content coming out this week. And uh, yeah, with, with that being said, Dom, do you want to jump into the next topic here? Yes, please do. So is this a good debut episode overall? Chris, you were the one that brought this idea up because we've been talking a lot recently in kind of our gluttony of Disney recaps about just debut episodes and how a pilot has to kind of hook you and how the idea of that has kind of changed as far as the whole pilot season. So you brought this point up. So kind of walk me through your thoughts on this. Do you think this is a good, taking aside like kind of all like kind of the marketing shifts that they had to put into this in order to kind of like remarket this and salvage this this thing after the whole Joss controversy came out. Do you think this is a good debut episode? So the one thing I actually credit this episode to for the first time in a long time is is not sort of showing signs of what we've been talking about here on the channel of, of being the pilot season. I mean, this episode immediately gets you into the mystery. It gets you into the world. It's, it's not just like giving you a taste where, okay, maybe we'll have something tangible by the end of this season to go off of for season two. Like, no, we have a lot thrown at us. But whereas that's a strength, it's also, in my opinion, its biggest weakness. I think that this, this, this debut is very messy. You meet a whole bunch of characters, and there's a whole bunch of names thrown at you, and they don't really do the best job of establishing... Uh, uh, you know, outside of the main two, right? Those two uh, women who are the sisters that you meet right away. I forget their names right now. They, they don't do a good job of establishing who they that are and, you know... Amelia True and Penance Adair. Right, thank you. And so they, they don't do a good job of really establishing the, the you know, the uh, the stakes of this world, right? Like, what is going to happen if the Parliament succeed in sort of, you know silencing the voices of the touched like what are the real real ramifications you know who who is the real foe aside from someone who just slams through an opera house performance at the end of this episode like what are we really up against you know it seems like only the people who were touched and a select few remember when that giant ship flew over at the end there so it seems like there's some sort of mystery there like well why did they have that moment where people were fainting kneeling sort of in awe and and, and feeling their humanity to the fullest extent and then three seconds later they forget about it go on their day and everyone acts like nothing happened like where is the sort of glue to bind that very intriguing hook throughout the course of this episode because to me so what you're telling me is that it's a typical HBO pilot, is what you're saying. Because that's literally every single HBO pilot in the history of like the company. But, but I think it's different in this one because of the scope of what they're trying to tackle. And knowing that there is six episodes, it seems like we have to cover a lot of ground now to get some sort of footing that keeps us gives us some stability going through this like as i am so I'll, I'll, I'll toss it off to you after i say this you know just to clarify my stance so people aren't too confused i am as intrigued as i am confused right now which isn't a bad thing well i mean i but. guess but my my question is is it six or is it 12 because I, I was reading in different spots and some spots said that it was some article said that it was 12 so did they did they cut the episode count in half or did or did i miss okay that? i saw an article from screen rant saying 12 Maybe they're wrong, okay, maybe yeah, they're right, I, I don't know. Yeah, because on Wikipedia, it only says six episodes right now, but we know the Wikipedia sometimes doesn't put up all the episodes that'll, that'll be airing at once, and it adds more as time goes on. So that 
I, I just wanted to make sure of that first and foremost. But as far as your points, I agree with you 100% because it was definitely one of those. I, I've, I've watched a lot of HBO pilots recently, so I completely understand where you're coming from as far as that goes. Where you're right, they kind of throw you right into the world. They're throwing all this shit at you. They're kind of like going from one action sequence to another. It's certainly it's certainly entertaining, and I certainly like the sense of like, okay, we're getting you know a taste of this world and a taste of all of these different characters and a taste of the stakes to come without actually getting like something that's like kind of tell you everything which in my opinion is what a good pilot is supposed to do but you're absolutely right it's definitely something where it feels like it's going from one thing to another so fast that i don't necessarily have time to process it and be like okay what the hell is going on before we just jump to the next thing and next thing you know they're at an opera house and next thing you know you have people coming up to the floor and they're just murdering people i'm like who the hell is this chick who is supposed to be like the evil bad guy and it turns out that they set her up from the beginning because she was one of the ones that was touched by the giant ship and i'm like all of this crap is happening at once. Yeah. It's hella cool, and I like it because the other thing that I like too is it doesn't, to me, fall, even though Whedon writes this episode, it doesn't fall victim to kind of like, and I'll get into this in a little bit once we talk more about Whedon himself, but it doesn't fall victim to me of kind of like the the snappy Whedon dialogue per se that I feel like a lot of people have criticized Marvel movies for because his kind of imprint is so strong that it kind of affected the rest of Marvel's films in general. But the thing is that I've never hated Whedon's dialogue, I've always, again, it's a reason why Buffy the Vampire lasted seven seasons and why Firefly was such a cult hit the way that it is. Like, he knows how to write good dialogue and he knows how to write good fleshed out characters, you know? Say what you will about him as a person, but at the very least, he does, he is talented when it comes to, like, setting this up. And again, if all of this, if this entire monstrosity is just his brainchild, like, kudos is all I gotta say, because this is already a very, very fleshed out world with a lot of intrigue and mystery that I'm actually really, really invested in and I want to explore. Yeah, the last thing I'll sort of add to that point um, is I, I, I do disagree with you obviously in the snappy dialogue I think he's good at it I just think it really diminishes and takes away from almost every moment I've seen him do it in in this situation uh, the one instance comes when they're sort of speaking pre-performance in the opera house and the characters are sort of starting to converge for the first time and you have the parliamentary guy and you have sort of the dude who's like the, the guy looking at crows and so they're all starting to come together and before they break apart and collide and it kind of devalued the, the moment a bit for me but I, I can see why people like it clearly the Marvel films are, are very successful uh, but you know what I will say is the world is very interesting. I just think it was poorly executed, but I think there is a solid foundation there. So I'm, I'm going to stick with it. Obviously, I'm going to give it a fair go. Like I'm not bashing this show to, to like smithereens by, by any means right now. But I but I am saying that like I hope that it finds its voice because right now it feels a little messy. So, yeah, with, with that right. being said, I mean, what do you guys think? Was this a good debut episode? Are, are you looking forward to a uh, Joss Whedon period piece show on HBO? Uh, let us know in the comments below. Uh, we'd, we'd love to hear what you guys think. And of, of course, be sure to subscribe and leave a like on this video. But uh, Dom, did you have another topic for us? Uh, I hope so. I did. So, <laughs> well, I mean, we kind of referenced it a little bit now. So I find it interesting that after sitting through eight weeks of WandaVision, nine episodes of them constantly hinting at, oh, or is this what's going to bring in the X-Men? Is this what's going to bring in the X-Men? Is this what's going to bring the X-Men? And then, like I said, all we got was a bad boner joke at the end of it in order to kind of pay that off. I'm never going to stop riffing on Marvel for that because that might be, of all the kind of like, uh, what's called the bait and switches, the bad bait and switches, I'll say that they've done, that still might be be the worst but yeah. <laughs> i do find it interesting how hbo essentially does an x-men pilot as a period piece is their whole thing right so i get so in order to kind of transition this into our next point which is is the nevers just an x-men period piece you know i do find that there is a lot of legitimacy to that argument because it's weird because i feel like after fox I'll say it too, screwed up the X-Men franchise so badly, you know, and we're kind of, and all those Marvel fanboys are kind of patiently waiting for the MCU to introduce the mutants in the way that they will, you know? I find it interesting that HBO kind of just pulls this out, and in a way, like, this is doing everything that the X-Men franchise was known for, right? It's having the good social comparison, it's having the good social commentary, it's having the kind of, it's showing the cool integration of them within the kind of the society at the time, and they're adding the, the extra edge of it being a period piece, which already makes it more fascinating, because that already introduces, let's say, a less tolerant time period for this, which already ups the stakes for the main characters, you know? So as far as that goes, I feel like this, to me, is doing everything that the X-Men 
X-Men movies were doing right, you know, because I feel like even though this is entirely what the X-Men is about, right, so to me, the reason why the X-Men were always the most fascinating, I'll say, personally, my favorite of the Marvel character, of the Marvel kind of canon of characters is the fact that they weren't superheroes. They were kind of fighting for social, they kind of were fighting for, you know, equal civil rights, and they were in a sense, kind of the the um, the allegory for a lot of the social commentary at the time. I know a lot of X Men comic book writers made a lot of interesting AIDS commentary within X Men comics during the '90s, as far as that goes. So, I guess my question is: Do you think that this is kind of doing everything that the X Men did that made them so cool? And do you think this has the potential to do that in a sense, potentially before Marvel does when they introduce the mutants? You know, because we all know how deep Marvel goes with their stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Very deep. Um, no, I. Uh, yeah. I certainly see the similarities. I think anyone would if they're sort of keeping their eye peeled to this this genre that has just consumed Hollywood and filmmaking of, let's say, the, the better half of the last decade and a half, right? So, yeah, clearly there's comparisons. And, of course, it has that typical setup where someone's taking in these orphans and trying to show them a way to use their powers, which I guess we don't really know too much yet, but I'm assuming that these these sisters are on the side of good. And so... Obviously, they're trying to sort of cultivate these young people and, and, and guide them, I think is the best word, guide them towards doing the right thing with their gifts and, and being able to cope with them. So it's very Professor Xavier. And of course, you know, Joss is no stranger to the superhero realm, specifically Marvel. So it does feel, I guess, a little second nature. But the thing is, I feel like it also has value in regards to it just being a good sort of like sci-fi fantasy setup like we've seen this before with other shows like i said with like the magicians and it's like it doesn't just have to be attributed to superhero uh the superhero genre sure this is very similar because these people get their powers whereas like with the magicians they're born with it and they cultivate it and and and, and it comes out at a certain point in their life kind of like with harry potter but like it's always been there you know but but so yeah sure someone gave them the power x-men similarities are abundant but but i do think this has the ability to separate itself by being rooted in a period piece i, I feel the writing was already way more sophisticated than anything we've gotten from marvel sort of dealing with parliament and that side of government and and dealing with the different social statuses of how some of these characters i guess are like urchins or or you know orphans and they're they're on the street they're poor deal it's like got classism in there it's like tackling bigger issues than i've seen tackled in marvel at least not until recently clearly marvel's trying to make uh up for lost time in that field, I'd say, with like Falcon and Winter Soldier. But like Literally. this out of the gates, I think, is already begging larger questions. So I think, yes, there are X-Men comparisons, but I do think that actually kind of puts it in a box and sells it short. Because while I said it was messy, I'm intrigued. Really? I really am. Right. No, I am too, especially given the fact that in addition to X-Men, they're also pulling from a myriad of other superhero properties, especially recently, because in a way, this in the in its debut episode kind of has explained what Umbrella Academy still hasn't been able to do within two seasons, which is it actually shows you, even if it doesn't actually directly tell you, it shows you at the very least where the fucking, where, where the Nevers got their powers from with the emergence of that giant ship in the end. Like, we don't know what that is. And the other cool thing about this is, and I did some research on this too, this is not based off of a pre-existing property in any way, shape, or form. This is a completely original property. So for me, the intrigue of it comes in for the fact that for once, we get a superhero problem. Like, even the boys, even as awesome as that is, the boys is still based in comic book lore in some sense. They can play around with it, twist some of the lore, but in the sense that the, the original source material is still there. This is a new original thing. There is no source material to pull from. There are certainly going to be allusions to other superhero properties, and we're probably going to see that as we go throughout the show. But for once, we actually get a superhero property where I have no idea what's going to happen next. And I'm actually amazed because we haven't gotten a property that's been able to do that in, God, I don't even remember. It was before Game of Thrones was a thing, that's for sure. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it seems like there's a web that's going to go deeper and that's going to make you think a little more than just a lot of these surface level properties, at least with how surface level Marvel seems to be, you know, with how simply Thanos was defeated and just all that, how how easy that arc was to just sort of write, you know, if, if you look at it as a whole, like it took how many movies to get there? Like, I, I don't know. Right. I just never saw the value in there. Whereas in this, I see some interesting questions being asked. I see something that, that keeps me on the line that makes me want to go back to episode two, even though it wasn't the most polished debut. Right. Because because this is also the thing 
that I want to give Joss Whedon credit for as well, just for, for like him as a superhero storyteller, just as a storyteller in general. You know, I feel like the reason why we personally gravitate towards his Avengers movies more so than some of the later entries is the fact of even at their most bombastic and superhero related, those movies were trying to say something, you know? As surface level as it was, I, that first Avengers movie still was, I think, trying to make a statement about whether we need still needed superheroes or whether there was even a need for superheroes in general. And Age of Ultron, messy as that movie was, was still trying to make a statement on, you know, again, I, I think, personally think, you know, poorly so, but again, like, just with how rushed that movie was, was trying to make a statement on kind of the influence of the internet and technology on these superhero statements. You know, those movies were to me still trying to say something, which again seems to be the total opposite of what Marvel is seeking to do with the majority of their superhero properties. You know, like you said, they're trying to make up for lost time now with their TV series, but that's why I've always been willing to give Whedon more credit than say like the, the other superhero, you know, that say than like the rest of the people working in this field overall. And it's especially why I'm willing to continue to give this show a go because even already with like just that myriad, just the ending montage of showing all the different people that seemingly were gifted by the ship, you know, if they, they were not all the typical like parliamentary people. It was all weirdos and freaks and outsiders kind of that were in such a, in that stance kind of before. They got superpowers, you know? So it was already kind of looking at the outsiders of society, right? And that's kind of like what I and, and that's kind of like why I'm really looking forward to this because I have a feeling that this show can still pull something out and say something really cool about that. I you agree, know? because that ending little sequence there, or scene rather, was very interesting because like we don't know anything about this ship. Was it aliens? Was it some, you know, uh, factions doing? It has a chance to while well, have that similar X-Men feel, that similar, I'd say, sort of sci-fi fantasy ensemble setup feel it has a chance to veer off in a direction that's different and refreshing and i really hope it takes that route man because it'd be so refreshing to see something that even though i don't think it is superhero I, i've seen the labeling i've seen the articles i i know everyone their superhero sickness isn't going to not see it that way so like if people are going to see it that way, I, I at least hope that they take the route, which is so clearly there and so available to them of offering something new to a very saturated genre but right. with that being said, man, um, let's get into our next topic. Before we do that, let us yes. know, like, do you think this is just an X-Men period piece? I mean, does it feel like we're building to something worthwhile or, or does it feel like we're building to something that we've seen before, except now we're just in Victorian England? Let us know in the comments, subscribe, give this video a like. And with that being said, Dom, do you have another topic for us today? Yeah, actually, the well, it, it helped because our previous topic, I feel like, kind of does build into our next topic. Because even though, again, I don't necessarily think of the when I think of superheroes, the X Men necessarily aren't the first one that I think of. Again, we've uh, it, this is the this is the latest installment. Again, be it well, you know how the marketing is on this. Even though by nature the show is more of a sci fi show, it is still unfortunately has been branded by the marketing a superhero show. So the next question and topic that I have is, what does this add to the superhero genre? And by default, also. Does the vision of this show translate in its debut overall? I think with that second point, I absolutely think it does because already this show to me is 1,000 times more visually interesting than the last like five kind of you know, Mar you know, Marvel superhero properties that we've seen overall, you know, not discounting everything. Again, we kind of, it's weird because this is kind of coming off of, again, Zack Snyder's Justice League and The Boys Season 2 and Watchmen and a whole bunch of other really distinct, really visually interesting kind of really, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Really, I feel like auteur-driven kind of like, like superhero things that actually do have things to say and aren't just the typical Marvel surface level thing. So, as far as what this adds overall to the superhero genre, that I think it still might be too soon to say overall, just because of so far, just based off what we've gotten in this pilot episode, we really only have kind of allusions to other superhero properties. But again, I think that's where that's where kind of the majesty of the show comes in because again, even though there are allusions to other superhero properties, this is still an original superhero property. So this has a chance to actually go in new and unique superhero storytelling directions that others may have been kind of withheld from doing because of their uh, because of their dictation on the source material, you know? Because that's so fascinating, right? As far as adaptations go, in the sense of where there was a time when an adaptation was supposed to be something kind of distinctly different from the thing that we got, you know? The fact of what makes Jaws the movie so interesting is the fact that it is so distinctly different from Jaws the book overall but now and I feel like Harry Potter had a lot to do with this we're in the sense of where if something is not devoutly 
like an almost shot for shot recreation of the original thing that it's based on. It's almost like people just like won't accept it for what it is, you know? So I think that's kind of like an interesting stance. I mean, you're a guy who's read a lot of comics, a lot more comics than I have, so you could probably speak better to that than I can, you know? Especially since Marvel's kind of taken that stance and kind of almost put their own stance on it. But like, what, what do you think about that? No, I think I, I pretty much agree with everything you just said. I think it was very well said too. You know, the Artur angle is a very interesting one to bring into the discussion. I really agree with that. Yeah, so I guess I'll sort of tackle it in the sense that what do I think it adds to the superhero genre sitting here fresh after watching the debut episode? I think the biggest thing it adds is hope for someone like me who's very, no pun intended, disenfranchised with superhero movies as a whole. Uh. I'm sick of the inundation. I think there is a huge superhero sickness that's going around right now where if it's not superheroes and if it's not a major franchise that's been pre-established like Fast and Furious or James Bond or Mission Impossible, it doesn't have legs to stand on which is very unfortunate like where's the room for new titles to grow and come about and so i think this gives me hope because it could be a way to sort of not only introduce something new to the superhero genre but challenge the pre-existing fields if this show does see success sorry the pre-existing titles in the field to up their game to truly give us something different you say we're going to get something different in phase four marvel clearly it's too early to tell the speak on that but Hey, if this show's successful, you may have to go back to the drawing board because I hope that this show, if anything, shows that people are waking up to the formula, are getting tired of the formula, and if we're going to keep getting inundated with superhero content, I at least hope that it begs the question of how can we do something that hasn't been done before because that's what I want, you know? There's thousands of comics, thousands of source material, yet it just seems like... They're not using any of it because the comics I read are so much more interesting than the movies and TV shows that I watch for the most part. Clearly, there's exceptions. The Boys, that Watchmen series of 2019. But that's a needle in the haystack. You know, that's every once in a while. Right. That's like the two that right. came to the top of my head. I should be able to name with how many superhero properties we have. At least five more, but I can't right now. I cannot do that in the right. heat of the moment. So does the vision of this show translate, right? That was your second point. I don't I don't necessarily yeah. know if it did. It felt a bit messy. It felt a bit felt a bit cloudy it, it, you know it, it's it's trying to do a lot and and it's going to take more than a pilot episode this this kind of goes to our argument of binge or or watch it week to week where i think maybe if we had all the pieces and i was able to sit down and binge all 6 or 12 episodes whatever it is i probably wouldn't even bring this point up but because of the way they chose to release it i feel confused right now but i also feel intrigued so i'm going to let you take that right. and bounce off all that but that's just kind of like my initial response to the questions we posed well, it's fascinating because we've talked a lot about kind of how the idea of autourism is just going away with the mass corporatization of everything, right? And it's kind of, in a weird way, we've kind of found ourselves in the same situation that we were in, like we saw in one of our favorite movies from last year, Mank, with the 30s and 40s, where everything is so kind of driven by the studios that there really isn't a chance for kind of this singular autouristic vision to shine through, right? And it's why we praise something like Zack Snyder's Justice League because even maybe though that movie wasn't nearly a perfect movie, it was just such an... It was just such a thing that we just never get anymore that we're willing to kind of give it. We're kind of willing to kind of cast aside some of our problems that we may have had with it as far, you know, in order to kind of reward the things that we rarely get anymore. And this, in a weird way, I kind of think also falls into that trick because, again, even as problematic of a, of a creator and an auteur as Joss is, Joss still is one of those guys that has a singular, unique vision, you know? And that is something that. I, again, it's so tricky because we'll get into this more with kind of the differentiation between the art and the artist, but it's something that we get so rarely nowadays. So rarely do we get something now that is truly the vision of just one person. And again, we praise all these directors that Marvel hires when really, how many of them actually have a chance to make their vision shine through overall? The answer is barely any of them. I can think of maybe three overall. It's James Gunn, Taika Waititi, and... Um, James Gunn, Taika Waititi, and... There, see, I can't even name a third one <laughs> overall as far as the different... <laughs> as far as different people whose kind of, you know, singular unique visions can shine through overall. And it's both disheartening, but at the same time, it's also tricky because, again, people seem to like the stuff that they get. And, you know, they like the studio dribble because they just want to be entertained overall, you know? And as much as we, like, you know, we, we constantly... We say that we hope that people are waking up overall. The sad truth is that, again, we are constantly the minority overall. And the majority of people do not care. They just want to get the thing that they are being entertained by. And right now, it is just the latest superhero thing. So I guess the question that kind of defines whether the show is going to have legs overall is 
will this show get the viewers that it can get? Because as far as factoring it also, what you were talking about with kind of the week-to-week thing, right? That's the HBO of it all, right? HBO has kind of made their mark in kind of the singular, unique space. Like, you know, they kind of were always a step above television, which is why they were kind of able to, I feel like, again, the botch release of HBO Max aside, kind of able to blend into the kind of the new age of streaming so seamlessly, you know? And why kind of Game of Thrones kind of almost lent itself to the kind of the early days of that streaming as far as, you know, the kind of being the epicenter of monoculture. Whether this show is the show that will be able to reclaim that spot? Absolutely not. I don't think it will be because, again, just for sheer fact of Disney and Marvel has kind of moved from film to TV now, but as far as kind of providing good alternative counter-programming, which is something that I think that HBO has always done an incredible job of overall, you know, back when they were kind of the epicenter of pop culture, you know, with kind of the, the Sopranos heyday, pre when Lost took over and was the talk of the town, you know, on cable TV, you know, when cable TV almost had a chance to reclaim its spot before AMC and Breaking Bad came out and then Game of Thrones came out and it was like, yeah, they're basically done with, you know? So, like, kind of, what, what's your take on all that? Yeah, I, I think uh, I can answer the monoculture question pretty easily. I've seen some articles trying and write that and say, hey, this could be HBO's new... Why does it have to be, though? You know, why does it... Right, right. Because that already, exactly. in, in turn, it's like my one of my major issues with that I've learned sort of being a critic is with the marketing. My second major issue is with the entertainment journalism that surrounds it. Why are you putting that... It's almost like you're setting it up for failure. Like, they have to know that when yeah. they... No, that's exactly you know, they, they have to know that it's self-sabotaging a completely new IP that has no previously existing source material that is just debuting trying to add that pressure of hey live up to a titan you know just because you're on the same network just because you're on the same sort of streaming service that this this monster show that like we always say dominated a monoculture I mean hey Talking Thrones debuting very soon stay tuned on our channel but uh (laughs) like why does it have to be? That's another issue that I have here. Like, why does it have to be superheroes, right? Superhero sickness. Why does it have to live up to something that it's similar to or in the same ballpark of? That's not art. Like, as much as I enjoy ranking and and critiquing film in that regard, sort of pitting a film against another film, there's a lot to learn there. I do think that we've also forgot the other side of it where it's it's art and it's subjective. So while someone can rank a list just because you like that critic or that commentator does not mean you have to live and die by their words. Don't let them brainwash you towards your review. Have that sort of, even though you can't yeah. speak to them, sit with that for the rest of the day. If you truly love movies, you want to sit with that person's ranking and be like... You know, I can see why he would say that. Maybe I'll change that on my list. But but the movie he put at number one, that was completely wrong. And I just don't know if those kind of conversations happen. So it's just like, I get it, you know? Maybe this is sort of an attack by the industry to sort of discredit Joss. Um, and you spoke about separating the art from the artist. Like, clearly, I, I know both of us don't condone if it's true, what he did behind Not the scenes. I haven't followed the case at all because, honestly, I'm just so sick of this stuff getting into my entertainment. But if it's true, obviously, we don't condone it. But like, hey, we're not talking about what he did personally right now. We're talking about the show. Right. So it's just... Right. And as of right now, again, like, they haven't taken his name off the credits. They obviously couldn't because that would have just screwed up so many things. You know, obviously he has been replaced as chief showrunner on the show. His name is still attached to the show. So, like, we kind of can't talk about the show without yeah. talking about it. And him, I would say you know? HBO is a respectable organization who, for the most part, does the right thing by, like, the, the culture and the social zeitgeist. So... I mean, at this point, clearly right. they haven't, you know, not aired the show or anything. So it's just, I, I just think the conversation is so wrong about this. And you know, it's interesting too. Th- this is something I'm learning in school about like marketing and journalism. Th- th- dude, the way that these writers are writing about all this stuff, it could just be like a tactic for like Marvel, since this has been marketed as a superhero series to m- remain on top, to kill any competition, which by all means is really smart by them. Can I get the conspiracy no, theories no, it's now? Not, it's, or is this it's, like an it's, actual it's thing? Just, it's just like knowledge of journalism, right? Like it, it's, it's right. sort of like these big companies give the screeners out. So the journalists, if they want to keep getting the screeners and get those clicks first, because it's a click per view marketing system, you do not get dollar signs t- in today's age if you don't get those clicks and the article that gets the the first clicks gets the most clicks so they want to you know not bash the movies too much when they get those screeners and they don't want to say the wrong things because they won't get the screener the next time and then slowly but surely they fall by the wayside just look at what happened with collider they started voicing their own yep. opinions and they stopped being a part of the monoculture of film criticism on youtube and where are they now so this isn't conspiratorial yep. at all it's just business and money talking nah, you're right you're right 
You're right. This is absolutely business and money talking. And honestly, it wouldn't surprise me. And I'm really, really hoping this doesn't happen. I mean, obviously, we'll see what happens at the end of this first season. But I have a bad feeling they're already shaping this up for a cancellation after one season. It, <laughs> it would not surprise way. me one bit. It would not. After everything that you just said about how, like, the industry, it would not surprise me one bit if that ends up happening, you know? Especially given because, uh, so I'm going to, so remember how before I named off all of those names, mm -hmm. um, what's it called? That, that were involved. So these are the other names that are involved in the in the production behind the scenes, uh, besides Josh Speedin. Uh Philippa Goslett, who has taken over as the showrunner, uh, besides Josh. Doug Petrie, who was one of the two showrunners involved with uh, Daredevil Season 2 and The Defenders. Jaina Spenson, who was a co-producer on Game of Thrones, who actually wrote one of my favorite episodes of Season 1. Eileen S. Landris, who was uh, actually a producer, a longtime HBO producer, going all the way back to The Sopranos. And Bernadette Caulfield, who is an X-Files producer and also a Game of Thrones producer overall. So, needless to say, I think it's safe to say that this is a slate of producers who know what they're doing as far as content. Totally, goes, no, you it's know? an experienced ensemble right there of uh, producers, man, for sure. I don't know, I guess not to get too far away from, like, the initial topic. I'm not saying I'm 100% right. I'm just a guy on YouTube giving his criticism who happens to study marketing and journalism as well. And to me, it would make sense, but, like, I, I might not be right. And so, obviously, that's just another angle that I don't see people talking about that I definitely analyze in sort of studying this type of stuff like I've been in the industry though on the music business side of things and I've been told by labels like hey you might want to write this type of song because your competitor on the other labels writing this type of song so it's just it, it's I just want people to think about the other side of things because it's just insane to me how one how how the biggest genre in the world right now for entertainment superheroes has really only been dominated by one company with the second one having little moments here and there it's very crazy to me yep now, it's very interesting because, again, for all the talk that people have of, like, oh, which casting is more appropriate online? No, this is the real stuff that determines what, what type of properties they're going to get and what comic books they're going to get. And it just it, it, it depresses me that, like, not many people are, like, using the tool that they have at their resource in order to find this out, you know? Well, why is it that every time we get something that should lead to more information, it leads to just spread of disinformation and yeah. less? So, what, whatever. Like, I just... that, that That's kind of all that I want Same. to... <laughs> kind of talk about as far as that goes but I definitely think that it will add something but it definitely seems like the marketing is going to be something it's definitely going to be an uphill battle for the show to say the least overall since it already seems to have started off like with with, with like with one foot like sh like shot yeah. so well, um, I don't know if that metaphor is an accurate comparison but you, you know what I'm yeah, saying yeah I agree with what you're saying too I was going to ask the audience I mean what do you guys think will the nevers add something new to the superhero genre do you think it has a chance I guess with how this topic has sort of shifted and changed throughout the course of the conversation let us know your thoughts in the comments below we we, we'd be curious to hear what you guys think. Of course, subscribe to this channel, hit that like button, turn on that bell for notifications, and Dom, let's move into our final topic, man. This has been a good chat. Yeah, let's do our final topic. Yeah, let's talk about Whedon. Let's talk about the man himself. We've been dropping his name throughout uh, a couple throughout this podcast a couple different times. And, I mean, safe to say that the man has certainly gotten a problematic record overall. A lot of people have come out and spoken against it, both for his actions on both Buffy the Vampire Slayer and, obviously, Ray Fisher has waged a never-ending seeming war against him for everything that he was involved with in Justice League, or in this case now, as has been aptly titled, Justice League. And it really is that interesting kind of conundrum that we have to ask ourselves, kind of just as viewers and lovers of this kind of entertainment, and every single time this happens, you know, and it seems to have been happening a lot more frequently recently, you know, as far as kind of the whole, my thoughts on kind of like the PC culture overall and what it's done to the industry, what it's doing to culture, you know, my thoughts on that are what they are as far as I think that it, it while it is, while it is a good idea in concert, I think it's largely going to do way more damage than actually like helping anything overall. And I don't think I'm alone in that sentiment overall, but that being said, it is a really tricky situation in the sense of where, even though the case against Josh definitely seems sound as far as the amount of people that have come out against him, the problem is we still don't have any definitive anything against him. Right now, everything is all just allegations overall, and there's nothing definitive or concrete, which is why this is such a tricky situation and why I think that HBO didn't just bother to just scrap this thing completely overall, you know, because given just, it, it's it's clear from the opening shot that this is Joss's baby overall and like that, that, that this is his from the get-go overall, despite all the different people that were involved with it, right? So... I, again, like, I'm not trying to, like, I'm not trying to, like, you know, discredit anything that's been raised against him, but it is a tricky situation that we constantly find ourselves in when the people that make the shit that we love the most always turn out to be some of the most problematic human beings overall, you know? Yeah, Dom, do you know where I just came from before we did this podcast? Where? 
Well, I, I know you were in a class. I, I and I, I, I know what I know where you're getting at as far as that goes, but I, I don't know the name of the actual That's class itself. So you'll have I to just came from an ethics in goes. journalism class, yeah. and my professor is a very, I'd say, open-minded person. I think she's very fair with her assessments. You know, we spoke a lot about the Kobe case and all that. And so the one thing I will say is I've looked up a few articles and guys, if I'm wrong in the chat, like I said, I've, and I've said this a lot over the past few weeks, go back and look up the videos. I am sick of these conversations stepping on the feet of all the creative people who make these shows happen. I think it's a very big detriment to the actors who are giving great performances to the crew who's making this show happen to the set design and this beautifully, you know, tapestry right. show. And so I'm just sick and I didn't, want to look into this at all because look I, I had nothing to do with if i was going to watch this show or not you know it's the court of law handles that so where i'm going with this is right now it's only seems to be alleged of course if he did it we do not agree with that here that's not right get get out no. nor do we condone of course it, never work with him again and, and i would wouldn't cover anything that he he did if, if he did it but as of now it's just allegedly right. so i think we all just need to sit back stop pointing fingers and let our system do its job because if we devalue the system it's not right. going to do its job so due process will and we need and we need to stop doing court and, and determination by twitter we need to stop with that that overall for again forget if it's kevin spacey or something as harmless as what happened with the season sorry we need to stop with this whole court appeal by twitter thing that because that is just damaging on so many and my professor levels. was just talking about this theory and she's worked for the new york times she's done a few different things like that as an opinion writer and stuff and and she was just talking about like it, it, it almost at this point in time doesn't matter what your court case says if you get killed in the court of public opinion on twitter good luck recovering your career like aziz got so lucky i don't know how he did that he yeah. was also oh, yeah. early on well hey, what's, it's funny that you bring that up because have you seen aziz in anything aside from the one stand-up special that he did since then even though he still did technically get lucky in that sense i guess you're right i mean he did have that show on netflix but i guess it did master of none did get canceled which was which aired long before okay it, and he's supposedly working on season three right yeah, that's now what I heard. but that's aired long before the allegations against you're him right, came though. out it is tough um and it's a tricky situation but it's like this is not why I got into being a critic. And with Falcon and the Winter Soldier over the past few weeks, this conversation keeps coming up. And I'm sick of not being able to talk about the plot line of a show because I disagree with something. It makes me an ist, an ist of that or an ist of this. That's not, no, that's me critiquing art. I'm not talking about like what it's doing. Obviously, I think all those things are great. You know, I'm trying to talk vaguely right now because I know this isn't true, too much of what our show's about. But if we're talking about Joss it seemed kind of impossible not to go to this point. So the whole thing is exactly like what you said, man. Twitter isn't a place of court. Of court, It isn't a place of law. It's a place of opinion. We need to start realizing that that's what it is. Someone could say something, but it's not about what they say, right? It's about what they do. And so there's a court case against Joss. He's going to have to answer for all that type of stuff. And hey, look, like we've said, you know, if something happens and, and it comes out that he did something wrong, like... Yeah, we're we're not going to support that. It's just not who we are as people. But we also don't want to, you know, quickly just drive a stake into someone because someone made a tweet that went viral. And I think it's the the, the biggest thing to me, which kills me as an artist. Right, I've been trying to be a creative professional since I was fucking twelve when I first started playing guitar. It's all I wanted to do. Like. <laughs> It's just like there's thousands of names. Did you guys watch the credits? I listened to the score. It was pretty nice. So I saw the credits. I was enjoying the, the music. It's actually really good music in this show. Um, and uh, there's a lot more names than just Joss. And I think it's so discrediting, disheartening, unfortunate for those people who are obviously all achieving their dream, working in the film industry. And we're not talking about their achievement here right now. We're talking about what someone may have done. Yeah. That, that's the part that kills me the most, man. No, I agree with you 100% because you're right. Because, again, as much as it sucks that, again, it always seems to be only one or two people that usually ever get credited with this type of stuff. You know, previously it was the stars, and now in recent time it's been the creators of the show. But it completely discredits the thousands of other people. Every single film production has no less than at least, a, a, to that caliber, has no less than a thousand people working on it, all in different capacity. And the problem is every single time one of these things happen, it discredits everyone else that works on the property, which sucks overall, you know, regardless, because regardless of the actions of said creator it doesn't affect the millions of other people that worked on set you know that that helped to bring this vision of this art that we love to life overall and that to me is what's even more destructive is the fact that every time one of those productions gets shut down because of the actions of one of these individuals that's however many millions of people that are not to that level of the social strata that are working class people like us that that have to work and live paycheck to paycheck that do not get to work 
And that's what's the most disheartening about this entire thing overall. Like with House of Cards, when they had that delay because of the whole Spacey thing, right? They eventually worked through it, right? And they managed to put out that final season, which was what it was. But that was, how many people was that that were out of work for that long, you know? It was a lot. It was a lot of people overall, you know? And Netflix has bounced back. And Netflix has definitely been the best I feel like when it comes to handling these sorts of scenarios overall, you know, say what you will about their company policies when it comes to certain of their individual properties, but at the very least, I'd say that they've done the best job as far as how to handle this type of scenario and move forward in the sense of allowing for these people to continue to work and moving past kind of the said, um, what's it called, kind of the heinous actions of certain of these creatives or stars involved, you know? And while the Nevers, I still think it's too soon to say, obviously, again, because the it was just bad timing as far as when the Josh stuff dropped, like right as this was getting wrapped and right as this was getting ready to debut overall, so there was kind of nothing else that they could do other than replace him as the main lead. So with them, it was kind of just, it was kind of just a timing scenario, but like kind of this, these are the things that we have to look forward to now as far as kind of the art and entertainment yeah. world, you know, and these are the discussions that are going to keep happening if this type of mentality is continued to be applied towards yeah, the, the art that we love. the witch hunt mentality. But, uh, yeah. Which is what it and is. Again, we call it like, that. Cause like we said, like Kevin Spacey, monster, terrible person. I never want to see him in anything again. We yes. agree on that. Joss Whedon, if he turns out to be true, yep. then yeah, I feel the same way about him as I do about Kevin Spacey, if it turns out to be true, but it hasn't yet. So we can't even answer, in my opinion, the question of this topic. You know, does this show embody the best of Whedon? Because it's not, it's not going to be given the legs to even garner that type of conversation. Right. I, I, right. I think it might. It's too early to tell just from like a critical standpoint, not sort of talking about the social side. Again, I thought it was messy but intriguing, but like because of this witch hunt mentality, like we don't even have the chance to uh, give someone the the chance to defend themselves. Which last I checked, he's an American citizen, and last I checked, he has the right to a lawyer. And the, and the court of law is where it's gonna, dude. He's gonna go away for a long time if like this stuff's true, like. And, yeah. and rightfully and this so. This stuff is true. I, again, great that he is a rich Hollywood celebrity and getting into the whole like, semantics of like kind of pop, you know, part of culture. Hopefully, again, like he doesn't get like the treatment that like almost it seems like every rich person does in, in jail. I'll refer you guys to Jordan Belfort. Mm -hmm. But kind of as far as that, but as far as that goes, like, yeah, if this goes through, like, obviously it's safe and to say he, he, it will not be taken lightly My last overall. point is, like, let's just use the Bill Cosby thing for so long. Hannibal Paris was having that joke yeah. for years before it happened, like... These people hurt, hear the rumblings. Family Guy had the Kevin Spacey joke in like the early 2000s. They just choose to ignore it because it's convenient for them at that point in time. So the Hollywood hypocrisy is too busy right. making dollar signs off these people. And so they don't want to raise awareness to it because, you know, Harvey Weinstein's making them a boatload of money. At least until it's yeah, convenient, until it's convenient for, for them before they get labeled the bad guys. In the 11th hour, they'll come through. So honestly, they need to answer just as many questions as the people on trial, man, because it's just a messed up system. And, that, and that's the part that sucks because this, the little people, the set designers, the prop makers, those are the people that honestly, the actual those are the people that artists? I love. And that's the reason why I'm a critic and I love watching film and dissecting movies and TV. It's not because of the corporate suits who are just as hypocritical and as just any politician, honestly, like, and it sucks that they have to be a part of this discussion because they just want to work, man. In an industry, we have to work to live. Yep. You can't, you can't yeah. not pay the bills. It's true. That's all I got to say on that. It's true. Nah, you're right. You're 100% right overall. And it, it sucks. It's a disgusting situation overall. That the, But again, I refer you to the line from Game of Thrones in order to wrap this up, but I feel like it could always, I feel it could be applied to any situation in this sense that it works so well because it happens that we're talking about an HBO show. Again, Jorah Mormont, rest in peace, that guy forever. Why is it the little people always suffer when the High Lords play their Game of Thrones? Like, Mic drop. There you go. Boom. I feel like that perfectly discusses <sighs> it overall. So, guys, thank you once again for tuning into our episode episode overall chris also before i did that thing again where i completely skipped to the final thoughts before we actually did it what are your final thoughts and star rating on the debut episode of yeah, the Netflix? i'm gonna go with a uh a three out of five generously a three out of five i wanted to do a two out of five but you know you kind of changed my mind a bit and sort of elaborated on some of the setup that maybe i just wasn't seeing because you know the marketing and all that got to me so i'm gonna go with a three out of five I i'm intrigued I hope it gets cleaner, though. It's a little dirty right now. I got to, you know, put some Windex on the window. I can't really see where I'm going, but I want to. So I'm going to work on that window and clean that window. That's my very terrible analogy to end it. But uh, yeah. I was about to say, your, your metaphors never <laughs> cease to you, make man? me laugh, to not make me laugh overall. But yeah, I, 
as far as pilots go, as far as HBO show, I, I think that, again, HBO, like everything else in kind of this streaming war and this glutton of content, their quality overall has definitely dropped, especially since their max content has not nearly lived up to kind of the hype and quality that their original HBO content has. But overall, I still think this was an intriguing pilot overall, taking, you know, taking aside, you know, the allegations towards the creator overall. I still think this was a very entertaining pilot. I'm especially intrigued to see where it goes. I feel like it's given me something that precious few other properties in general have given me something, which is something that feels original in the sense overall. And it definitely seems like something that I'm very interested in seeing where it goes, even if the initial product wasn't necessarily what I thought it was. So I will give this... I'll go three and a half out of five overall for this for this uh, debut pilot overall. So with that being said, people, that was our podcast discussing the Nevers debut overall. What did you guys think? Did you guys get a chance to watch the Nevers? If you didn't, I would definitely recommend going and watching it overall if you just want something kind of new and cool and different to watch overall, some kind of more a good counter programming overall to kind of the, the the Marvel-ism of the day. Overall, let us know your guys' thoughts in the comment section below. Be sure to also click the like button and the subscribe button and the little bell next to the subscribe button. That way you guys get notified every time we put up new content. We've got so much new content that we've got coming for you down the line. This Wednesday, actually... We've got an interview with another Kim's Convenience cast member. I don't know how we keep doing this, but we somehow do it. Chris, who are we interviewing uh, on We're going to be speaking with the actor who portrays Enrique. Who it's Enrique, I Enrique know, is the character. Is, uh, which I one didn't of my favorite big that, characters. I didn't realize uh, that we were going to be interviewing Enrique, which I love that. He's, he's hilarious, hilarious, man. Uh, his name is Rodrigo Fernandez Stoll. He's a uh, Second City actor, so he has some, uh, you know, improv uh, skill sets too. We're going to be able to talk to him about a lot, guys. It's going to be. He seems like the nicest dude ever. Yeah. So yeah, Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard. See you there. Yeah. That that's gonna that's gonna be a lot of fun. I can't wait for that. Just I've loved each and every single one of these Kim's interviews that we've had. We're first with Ja, then with Sukith, and now with uh, and now with Rodrigo. And we're we got we got a couple more coming down the line. We've got obviously our penultimate Falcon and Winter Soldier episode that we'll be covering this coming Friday night, and then the following week, unfortunately, we will have to bid adieu to another one of Chris's favorite shows that was Axe Unceremoniously. We will be doing our wrap up goodbye episode for Kim's Convenience for our podcast episode. Yeah. After that, we've also got our our Oscars draft coming up. We've got Mortal Kombat coming up. We've got so much coming down the line. May, you guys thought that April was crazy as far as the amount of content that we're going to just wait May and getting into the summer months. Where th things are just getting revved up, if, <laughs> if you know what I mean, as far as a certain first time. That's one, awesome. That we're doing, oh, you thought I wasn't going to be able to crack a car pun. Oh, they're yeah. doing, oh, we're just getting started as far as that goes. It's going to be a it's gonna be a good one. And, of course, you guys can keep track of everything that we're doing by following us on the social media's profiles, following us at Talking TV on or at Talking TV Podcast on Facebook and Instagram overall. Chris, where can the good people follow you on yeah, the man. interwebs? Yeah, Thank you. They could follow me at Christian Ivanko. Ivanko spelled E-V-A-N-K-O. I'm on Anywhere That Matters, a.k.a. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube even. I have uh, a bunch of music coming down the pipeline. I also have another podcast called Talking with Andrew and Chris, a show about life, music, and everything in between. That's Talking spelled the same way we spell it here on our show. And uh, yeah, just hit the link in my bio on any, on any of those platforms to, to hear me sing or to hear me talk about music and other types of stuff. Yeah. So uh, thanks, Dom. And what about yourself, man? Where can they find you? I I think the most recent thing that I posted was I actually posted about this show this morning after I finished watching it uh, on my Facebook, of course, and Instagram at Movie Nerd Reviews, where I posted, has anyone watched this yet? Started out a bit generic, but it's got potential overall. I think that's just going to be like a thing that I start doing, uh, just like reading my most <laughs> recent sarcastic Facebook posts I that it. I make overall. But yeah, Movie Nerd Reviews, Movie Nerd Reviews on Facebook and Instagram overall. I, I might be doing something productive on there. I have no idea. Again, they're my personal pages that I post on. I'm almost up to a thousand followers on Instagram Damn. so cool Kudos, solid actually I guess like I don't know how many I don't know how many of those are spam accounts but I'm like cool I guess and I'm I only started my Instagram account for the first time three years ago so winning no, at life I guess I have no idea I don't, I don't know what the current currency is on social media as far as followers <laughs> go so but you guys can follow me there overall let us know again what your thoughts were on the nevers we'll see you guys on Wednesday for our interview with Rodrigo and of course 12 scenes in a short film and watch more fucking movies. We'll see you guys next time.